So in the spirit that we can do it, I will try to give you an overview in the next five minutes about the refugee housing situation in Germany and the case study we're working on in Tübingen currently. So to start with some key numbers, the graph shows the dramatic increase of asylum applications in recent years. Since the beginning of the crisis in 2015, almost 900 refugees applied for asylum, out of which 40% came from Syria and over 70% are under 30. And even though there are less refugees coming recently since the beginning of 2016, it is assumed that up to 2.5 million refugees might come until 2020 to Germany. This will be a great challenge, but also a chance that re refugees will rejuvenate our aging society. In Germany, each state is independently responsible for the refugee housing, and this leads to different approaches. The centralized organization in Berlin, for example, results in questionable commu communal mass housing designed by the authorities, as you can see in the upright image. Baden-Württemberg in the south, for example, hands over the responsibility to local municipalities latest after two years. And this leads to much more decentralized and integrated housing strategies and is in favor for the integration of refugees. And of course, there's an intense debate going on in Germany how to solve the issue of housing as part of, uh, of the integration of refugees. And I believe the most important common requests are that we need uh, small scale and decentralized solutions that are integrated into the urban fabric and infrastructure. But what we eventually really need is much more affordable housing for all migrants, not only refugees coming to our cities in the future. And so according to the reality check presented here in the German pavilion at the Biennale, we find large scale solutions from above based on the logic of containers or modularity. And of course they are built very fast, but I feel they sometimes bear the risk of monotony and a certain monofunctionality. On the other hand, uh, we find small uh, scale um, solutions from below um, that are based on a lot of uh, civil, civic engagement for example, renovating uh, existing buildings and do it yourself solutions, building with uh, Euro pellets. And of course, they're super integrated uh, projects, but I mean, I'm not sure if they can actually meet the massive demands we're facing at the moment. Another small but very scalable solution is the online platform called Refugees Welcome that connects refugees with available rooms in shared flats or homes. They could match already three, over 300 people, and I think this is a great reminder of what we really need to achieve, which is integrated urban neighborhoods. And our proposal for the design of an integrated neighborhood, uh, the urban shelf, is very much based on healthy walking and inclusive and human scale urban mobility concepts beyond the car and I think beyond the elevator, which has, should be maybe discussed more, which is actually the background of our work in the studio. Also through workshops in Rio, we learned that the urban shelf could be a strategy to integrate a solution from above, the shelf, with a basic technical infrastructure and a solution from below, the self-built walls and units. And when we were told from locals that qu actually quite a few of those buildings in Syria are structurally still intact and could be restored, and as Syrian architect Marwa Azabuni points out, that we must not repeat the mistake of investing in Syria's buildings without first considering the people who are to live in them, end of quote. So that's when we asked ourselves if refugees could even help to build their homes in Germany so they would learn construction methods that might enable them to help rebuilding Syria. So we believe that the integration of both strategies from above and from below might be a solution to fast, affordable and good housing. And of course, our proposal is part of a bigger movement with similar approaches and with the same historical references. So our case study in Tübingen could be explained uh, in four steps. First, the state provides inner city land with a price reduction for social, social housing project. The basic infrastructure, including circulation and technical installation, is implemented by a professional construction company and a workshop is installed in the ground floor. So step three and four, together with the help of the refugees, the shelf will be finished and can be populated step by step in small units for two to six uh, people. So beyond the knowledge transfer and the identification with the built environment through participation, we hope that the visible productivity could be a signal to a right-shifting center in our society at the moment. And of course, this effort can only be realized with project partners like Kukula, who have uh, experience in woodworking with refugees and in combination with smart construction systems based on a wooden brick that can be handcrafted locally in the workshop. Further, we want to apply earth building technologies like ramped earth and uh, walls or self-made bricks in reference to the construction methods in Syria. Uh, so as a design concept, we actually want to articulate the integration of solutions from above and from below, also through the material contrast uh, of the shelf and the organic materials of the infill walls and we hope that, that the open circulation stimulates informal communication and interaction between the different inhabitants 
and would allow future extension of the shelf. And last but not least, the urban shelf manifests a process of an integrated neighborhood which is transformable and open to the needs of any future inhabitant. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Max. Your presentation gives us the excellent opportunity to explore this notion of scale and scale of decision making and intervention a bit further. Um, I mean, you chose at the very beginning a comparison between the German state of Baden-Württemberg and then uh, Berlin, which is a tricky one because Berlin is a state but it's also a municipality. So purely talking from a sort of legal managerial perspective, decisions are taken exactly at the same government's level the level of the municipality. But in one case, it's three and a half million people. In the other case, in Baden-Württemberg, towns, whatever, 50,000, 100,000 people. You then moved on and you showed this slide about the shelf, where you have a sort of foundation within which um, more temporal, more ad hoc decision-making can take place. Can you just dwell on, on the first hand this sort of governance question of decision making and then this question around the architectural intervention and the decisions that go with that. Mm -hmm. I mean, on purpose we chose these two extreme uh, examples to show that if a centralized um, kind of decision making process is going on, I think it also leads to designs that are very questionable as we see in, in Berlin. Yes, of course, Berlin is much smaller, but I think, you know, you also could hand over the responsibility to local municipalities within Berlin, and that doesn't happen at the moment. And I think, you know, the, the, so again, I, the, the comparison, I think, could be, it could be still valid, and even though, of course, uh, Bad Rudberg is a much bigger state and you have to hand over, but I think it, it just is it, a good example of what we can learn for also in smaller states, uh, city-states in Germany. So is your... Is your, advice, is your advice for Berlin to devolve the current decision making about these infrastructures to the borough level or even to the neighborhood level, although there is no decision making structure in place? The, the neighborhood, the neighborhood uh, kind of municipality. And I think that right now they're just, they're just told where these, you know, these uh, mass housing will be installed and they, have the, they can actually um, they can, um, go to trial against it, but uh, that's, uh, that's the only, uh, they're not part of the decision making process and I think that could be improved. Around the table, are we convinced that this idea of decentralization of the decision making when it comes to uh, responding very quickly, uh, very proactively to crises like the ones we are seeing is a real important component of getting it right? Or is there also a case we can make for centralization, particularly in those moments of crises? Roxana. Yeah, um, I would like to go a little back just with the question and then now connect it because I, w I wanted to say something before. So I, I think that we found ourselves playing professional roles that surpass our capacities as architects and that's true. But it, it is also true that we as architects have to do a lot of things, you know, work with community, public authorities, fundraising, advocating, teaching, and um, we're, we're not um, educated to do that. But to put it in action, I think we have to do it. So I think that we, what we have to do is learn how to do those things and, and work in different ways, in this middle ground, because also we're in the middle ground between top, um, top down and bottom up. And um, we also solve gaps and, and loopholes and uh, we're doing a lot of things, and then how do we, again, connect with architecture, but we are dealing with all these things, so. Now, uh, Ilan, I mean, the issue uh, at stake, refuge, uh, is of course something you're very familiar with, very exposed to directly in the region. You're a mayor of a city which is very close to those areas of conflict. How do you react? First of First of all, we, we hear all the bombs beyond the, the border and we know what's happening in Syria. Uh, my city, we have the biggest uh, hospital in all the north of Israel and we get a lot of refugees from Syria. You know, Israel and Syria, they're enemies. But uh, in that case, we work under the radar. I cannot tell all the details, but we help them. If refugees run to the border, we open the gate and you give him a, a treatment in my hospital. It's a decision that I take together with the government that it's going to happen uh, on the time of the people of my city. We, because when a Syrian uh, wounded come to the hospital, 
you need to clear all the department because they need to be isolated because the six and all what's happened there and a uh, security problem. So my citizen uh, suffer, but we do it with the open heart. And I believe, and I'm very happy to hear what you do in uh, Berlin, that in the end of the day, I believe that the refugee from Syria, they won't come back to their home. So in that time, when you tell me that you learn them and teach them how to build and how to uh, take uh, care of themselves, and then one day they're going to come back to their home, it's a wonderful thing, and we need to think like that. It needs to be a short time, and all, the, uh, all the, the power and the energy is to give them a good health, good uh, teaching, a good time, and in the end of the day, we are very optimistic that mm. they're coming back, and uh, it's going to change the Middle, the middle East that we live today. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much.